Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. I'm Gretchen McCulloch, and today we're going to be talking about colour. But first, uh, we want to point out that all the transcripts for previous episodes are now online, so you can check those out. And Lauren, what have you been up to lately? I have been in the world of gesture and the world of language data archiving. So I've been at eGesto conference in Porto in Portugal, which was a delightful place for a delightful conference. And I've been archiving language data with a couple of projects, one of which is super exciting and I don't want to be one of those people that like holds exciting projects over people's heads, but I've been doing some work with 1970s data recordings. Um, That's pretty cool and coming along nicely and of course getting my own data into an archive that will be accessible for other people to look at whether they're speakers of the language or interested in the language or want to do linguistics on it. So that's been my month. How are you? I have had a pretty quiet month but at the end of February I'm heading to ICLDC which is the International Conference on Language Documentation and Conservation in Hawaii. I am so jealous. I say having just come back from Porto. (laughs) I am really excited because I've been hearing about this conference for years and I have not made it yet. So this is a big international conference about language revitalization and I'm going to be running some workshops on getting your language information on Wikipedia and I'm also really excited to learn more about what other people's projects are they're working on. Awesome. I'm so excited that LingWiki, the linguistics Wikipedia editing thing, is having a season in Hawaii and uh, the ICLDC conference is so great. It has such a good community and I'm sure ICLDC7 will be a hashtag with lots of action on it in late January, early March. Yeah, so check out that hashtag. We'll try to tweet something about that. I'm sure I'll be tweeting from my own Twitter account on that hashtag. I don't know how much people use hashtags at gesture conferences, so maybe check out Lauren. <laughs> lots. Oh, good. Okay, good. You just have to take photos of the gestures. Yeah, I'll add a link in the show notes as well okay. to the eGesto hashtags. That's what Twitter's photos are for. Ah, photos. I forgot about those photos. <laughs> I'm so excited that today's topic is colours and colour and language. And you may be wondering why we would be interested in talking about colour and language at the same time. And that is for a number of reasons. If you take a cross-linguistic perspective, you find that there are a variety of ways in which different languages cut up the colour space in order to talk about them. And that has some really interesting implications. Yeah, so I guess the simple reason is colours are things that we have words for, but not all languages have the same words for the same colours. So you have a potentially visual spectrum of possible colours that exist and languages that carve up that visual spectrum in some ways that are similar and in some ways that are different. So Lauren, do you have a story for us? I have conveniently two languages that I've learned at two points in my life illustrate this really neatly. So when I was in primary school we were taught, um, I'll put that in some quote marks, Italian and I still remember in grade five or six writing about, you had to describe a face and I wrote and, and this will probably not be grammatical Italian because I'm remembering what 11-year-old Lauren knew, but I wrote something like occhi blu, so that, that person has blue eyes, blue being the Italian word for blue. And my Italian teacher was like, nah, it, I mean, that's a fine, I understand what you mean, but the person actually has occhi azzurro, or there's probably an adjective uh, conjugation there that I need to do that I haven't done. But for eyes, for this Italian teacher, you don't use the word blu, you use the word azzurro. And people have argued that Italian actually has two basic colour words for what we think of as blue. And blu covers everything that's like royal blue and really rich blues and darker. And azzurro is like light blue and sky blue. And so I didn't really get it as an 11 year old and it's still hard for me to kind of think of this. But then when I started learning Yolmo, which is a Tibetan language spoken in Nepal, they have one word for blue, but that word also includes most of what we think of as green. And this is sufficiently common. It's not actually that unusual for languages to have one word that covers everything we describe as blue and green. And it's so common that these are often referred to as languages that have a colour gru, um, which is a word I like very much. So there's the portmanteau of green and blue, in case anyone really needed that explained to them. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks. Thanks for explaining that. 
I think it's I think it's good that you've explained it. So you have Italian, which creates divisions across what we think of as one colour, and a language like Yolmu, which covers what we think of as two colours with one word. And this is something that happens pretty commonly across the world's languages. Yeah, and if you think, I mean, the, the light blue, dark blue thing may seem weird to English speakers, but if you think of the fact words for red and pink, where pink is really just a light red, and historically English didn't have a word for pink, you can kind of get a sense of, you know, imagine if we did the same thing but for blue. Yeah, and people had been kind of aware of these differences across languages, but the study that's often cited as the thing that kicked off a kind of consistent research agenda in colour terms across languages is a study by Brent Berlin and Paul Kay from the 1970s. Oh, it was actually published in 1969, the monograph. So this was research done in the late 60s and then was really popular and replicated and discussed a lot in the in the 70s and 80s. I think they did a second study in the 70s and 80s. They did it like again but more broadly. So the bigger one that they get cited on is from the 70s. Yeah, so they decided that they wanted to the, the first pilot version in the 60s, they got, you know, some 20 people or so who spoke some languages that they knew, you know, you kind of wander around, you know, your linguistics grad department and find people who speak different languages and ask them about their color terms and then they replicated that on a larger scale by sending people out or working with people who were already going out and doing linguistic field work and giving them a box of color chips like paint chips that you get in a store to match your colors and giving them these type instructions which you can see we'll link to those in the show notes if you want to see the original instructions that they send out to people and the color chips that they used are specifically known as munsell chips which don't sound very tasty but the thing that's important about munsell chips is that they are produced with incredibly consistent colors so whatever is munsell color 42 is going to be exactly the same across all of the munsell sets so you have this real consistency in the colours they were questioning people about across languages. Yeah, so they sent out people with all these consistent colour chips and they asked them, okay, can you get some people who speak whatever language you're working with to sort these chips by groups that all belong to the same colour and by the most kind of basic colour terms. So in English terms, you'd be sorting out things like red and blue and even pink, but you wouldn't be sorting out sky blue, which is a colour term that has a a literal word attached to it, or bright red versus dark red. So they were trying to get people to avoid using extra descriptors and just use whatever the most basic set of colour terms was that that language had. So English has 11 colour terms, I think. Yeah. Let me see. Red, green, yellow, blue, brown, purple, pink, orange, grey. I've only got up to nine. Maybe I meant nine. I think it has 11. Oh, I missed black and white. There we go. Oh, there we go. Black, white, red, green, yellow, blue, brown, pink, purple, orange, grey. That is actually cross-linguistically quite a lot of words, but we can make even broader distinctions if we talk about light blue, dark blue, warm yellow, cool yellow, off-white, these kind of extra descriptors. Yeah, and there are a few languages that have more distinctions. Korean apparently has a distinction between yellow and greenish yellow. Yeah. I think kind of un uncommon cross-linguistically, but they do it. It's a little bit weird the fact that English has words for purple and violet, which generally people consider basically the same colour, but we do have two quote-unquote basic colour terms for it. Yeah, so there are also a variety of terms like violet and turquoise and colours that are sienna, for example. So these are considered to not be basic because they're not part of the basic vocabulary that is taught to children. They're more technical terms. They're generally, they're terms from a specific specific thing. So turquoise has that colour because it's the colour of turquoise. Or amethyst, you could say that's a nice, I, I would never say that's a nice amethyst sweater, but if, if you wanted to you could, it would be grammatical, but it's an extension of the meaning of the colour purple from that stone, and it's within, it's a sub-colour within purple. But if you look back historically, some words that we now consider basic English colours at one point were words that were used to refer to a specific object. So I'm harping on pink a lot, but the word pink originally meant a particular type of flower, kind of like a carnation, and was later extended to mean the colour. The word orange started out as the fruit and then became the word for the colour 
even like a word like black in English, which is a very basic color term, originally comes from a Proto-Indo-European word meaning burnt. So you can make these etymological links. I guess it's when seekers kind of become unaware, unaware of the etymological links that they really become basic color terms. It blew my mind in undergrad when I learned that black is historically cognate with a lot of the European terms for white. So in other Germanic languages, you have something like German Schwarz, which I definitely didn't say right. And then in all the Italian, French, Spanish languages you have words like bianco or blanc or something like that which is cognate with black because black means something that's like burnt or brightly lit. Burnt up versus burning brightly. Burnt up, there you go. So these terms can change and evolve. English also has words blank and blanch, which bleach, bleach, which all come from the same root, but refer more to the like removing of color than the the darkening of something. So there's a connection there. And this is one of the things. So what this K and Berlin color survey found is that languages differ with how many basic color terms they have, somewhere between about two and about twelve, and that they need to follow at least an approximate trajectory. They they specified quite a specific path, but later research has shown that there are a few more divergences than, than they noticed. So if a language only has two color terms, they're going to have terms for light and dark. And this, I mean, it's hard to imagine as an English speaker speaking a language that only has two color terms. Generally, these cover a pretty broad spectrum of so it's not just dark and light, it's like these are dark and cool colours and these are the light and warm colours. Um, but that's your, your most minimal set of colour terms. Yeah, and then if you get an additional colour term in that, number three, uh, you're going to end up with kind of the red spectrum. All of the stuff in around red. So now you have light and dark and red as a distinct thing. And then after that, things diverge a bit more. Sometimes people's fourth color is a yellow, sometimes it's a green, but those are those are yellows and greens that also include stuff like blue, because remember lots of languages don't split up green and blue, uh, but probably mostly light blues because your dark blues would still end up with black in the dark spectrum. And then once you have green and yellow, you generally have blue after that, brown follows, and then stage seven, is purple, pink, orange, or gray. So you get more and more sophisticated and nuanced color terms. Yeah, you get finer variations there. But so there's a, you talk a language that only has three color terms and those terms are turquoise, orange, and pink. Yeah, because that's not covering a lot of the, <laughs> I mean, it might be covering a lot of the color space in your wardrobe, but not for all speakers. <laughs> no orange. <laughs> turquoise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's not surprising that, you know, we were talking about pink and orange and these later stage colours in English have really clear and relatively recent etymologies compared to something like red or green or white. But I remember when I learnt this stuff in undergrad, a friend who I was doing this with was completely, she just would not believe that you could cover brown, purple and grey in one colour. She was just like, how could you have one lexeme that covers, or one word that covers all of those three? And then <laughs> one day she came to class and she was so excited and she was like, look, look at this scarf that I bought. And it was true. You couldn't tell in certain contexts it looked brown and in some contexts it looked purple and in some contexts it looked grey. <laughs> and that was her like theoretical proof that those colours were close enough that it made sense to put them in one lexeme. Well, and the scarf actually brings us into an interesting point about why languages develop colour terms, which is that there's often some relationship between produced goods, whether that's dyed fabrics or gemstones or other types of processed goods that people make into specific colours. Because if you're thinking about the sky, for example, you know, we say all the time, oh, the sky is blue, but it's really not necessary to specify that the sky is blue. You can say the sky is dark or light, the sky is cloudy or clear, and if it's clear and it's light, of course it's blue, what other colour is it going to be? Or you can say something like the tree is, is living or the tree is dying. You don't necessarily need to specify that the tree is, is green or that it's red. So a lot of colours in nature, a lot of things only really come in one specific colour. Yeah. Whereas once you start making cars, you don't say this car is ripe or it's not ripe or this car, car is cloudy or it's clear or this dress that you're going to make is ripe or unripe or that this... <laughs> you know, basket that you're weaving is dyed a particular colour. Once you start dyeing stuff in colours, it becomes more useful to talk about finer variations. Or if you send someone to buy for you a particular thing in a particular colour, you may want to specify exactly what that colour is going to be once you start colouring stuff artificially. So certain technological innovations can give rise to the necessity for finer distinctions in colour terms. 
And some color terms are, are etymologically linked to specific things that created those colors. So purple is linked to the name of this particular mollusk that was used to make purple dye back uh, around ancient Greece. So the original Berlin and K survey has grown because it was really well written as a methodology and using the Munsell chips meant that lots of people could get these colour sets and go and test with lots of different people around the world. And the World Atlas of Language Structures has a map about the number of colour terms across a large number of languages. They currently have 119 languages in walls. I don't think we've talked about walls on the podcast yet somehow. No, so WALS is an acronym for the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures, and it is a very cool website. You can go look at it yourself, anybody, at walls.info. We'll link to that in the description. And you can check out all of these cool maps of different linguistic features as, as dots on particular maps. So in this case, you can look at a map that has the red dots are the languages with this many color terms and the yellow dots are languages with a different number of color terms. And you get kind of a, a view at a glance. I will say Wall's great and it's a good resource. It's got, you know, often a couple hundred languages for a particular feature, but it doesn't have all the languages. There are like 6,000 languages and many of them just don't have the kinds of grammars. But it's as comprehensive as we've got. Yeah, many of them just don't have the kinds of grammars that can be used as input to a database like Wall's. So it's a very cool uh, resource, but it obviously overrepresents the languages that we have grammatical descriptions of. So there's lots of data and walls for South American, Central American, and kind of Central West African, and Australia and Papua New Guinea for colour terms. And interestingly, the lowest number of colour terms in a language in the wall survey is three for basic colour terms. Hmm. And languages with only three include Murimpata in... Uh, the Northern Territory of Australia, a number of West African languages including Wobe and Dan, and then only one that I can see in Southern America which is Kampa. Hmm. So uh, we'll put the show notes, you can have a click around on the map and look at all the languages and the distribution of colour terms there. I will say that one hand it's very cool that the KM Berlin survey has this very standardized set of chips and does allow you to do these cross-linguistic comparisons, but when we were doing some research for this episode I also came across a paper that pointed out that it can be also useful to look at the color terms for a language in terms of how speakers use them specifically to refer to natural objects, because sometimes this can illuminate stuff that the very standardized color chip approach doesn't illuminate. So the example that they had was there was a language that made a distinction between light and dark uh, or, or black and white and then also between reddish brown and pale green and you think huh that's a bit of a weird distinction to make maybe but if you look at how they actually use the words the pale green group was for living growing things and often wet things uh -huh. and the reddish brown group was for dry or desiccated or dying things right so if you cut a stalk of bamboo off and you saw that open, that wet opening of the like raw bamboo, that was considered this pale green color, even though literally speaking it's brown. Whereas if you have a dry leaf, which might be the same shade of brown, that's considered the reddish brown color. So there are pros and cons to doing a very standardized approach, I guess. Yeah, and one thing people have criticized it for is this lack of cultural context and specific conversational context. Another thing that's worth talking about in relation to color terms and how people use language to describe color is that there aren't just differences across languages, there are also some differences within language with different groups. And there's been a variety of studies looking at this, but we just thought we'd talk about some of the ones we know and find interesting and worth talking about. So one of the first uh, effects that we see is an effect of gender and uh, there's a really great study here from 1977 by Elaine Rich on sex related differences in colour vocabulary in which she finds that there is a difference between men and women in terms of how large their colour vocabularies are. Do you want to guess which way that effect goes, Gretchen? I, I think if you're going to get me to guess, that means you're setting me up for something. So generally people assume that women have a larger vo colour vocabulary than men. Are you going to tell me that's not the case? I'm going to tell you it's the case in this study. Oh, okay. But there are some like other, other factors involved as well. So in the survey that the researcher did, which involved a set of 25 colour cards, she used, I love it, she used the Crayola 64 crayon colours. All right. Um, 
as her focal colours um, because she wasn't using Munsell chips. And uh, then she surveyed a, a variety of groups of people and she found that women did use more and more elaborate colour vocabularies than men. But there were other complicated factors involved. So for example, there was a social class difference and there's also an age difference. So younger men have larger colour vocabularies than older men in her study. Hmm. What was the social class difference? The social class was technical versus non-technical jobs for younger women in the demographic. I, she doesn't actually define what a technical job is as far as I can see, but there, so there was a professional distinction there. So one of her groups that she studied were a group of Catholic nuns, and these women did score lower in the number of colour terms they used than the other women in her survey. So even within languages, there are um, different factors that indicate how many colour terms a person might use, even if the language has a variety of them. I came across a study of, I think it was people in, women in Eastern Europe, and the age effect that they found was the opposite, that the older women had more colour terms, and specifically that the older women had more colour terms related to traditional dyeing methodology for textiles, Okay. whereas the younger women had become disconnected from traditional dyeing terminology for textiles and could no longer identify words like matter and russet and stuff like this that are used in traditional terms. They tended to use more like industrialised color terms. Right. So I think, you know, there's the famous London cab drivers study, which shows that people who have been driving cabs in London for years and years and years and learned all of the little byways in London have, you know, developed a really good sense of directions for London. They've got larger hippocampi to give you uh, directions. And I think that this seems to be one of those, like, if you use it, you, you get more words for it, like with many specialized domains. Yeah, there's a yeah a, a professional vocabulary distinction to be made there as well. I do remember reading something, and again, this is we're into like unsighted anecdata here, but I do remember reading something that said professionals can discriminate with more lexical items and words, like technical words, um, but it doesn't mean they necessarily see more colours than people who don't have these professional words. So you might give people colours and one is magenta and one is russet and people might say, well, they're within red. Um, someone who does fabric work will know that's magenta and that's russet. Someone who doesn't and has to discriminate will be like, well, this one's rustier and this one's richer red. And so they can still see the difference. It's not like not having the word. And, you know, people who I'm friends with in Nepal who predominantly speak a language that doesn't have a blue-green distinction still see the distinction. They still prefer fabric and one colour over another. Um, so we're not saying anything about it affecting the way people literally see colour. I'm also going to put a link in the show notes to Randall Munro of XKCD's colour survey from 2010. Uh, results relatively similar to those found by Rich in the 70s, except he had a few more data points. Um, he had people labelling colours on their computers, so there's a monitor effect here. He had, yeah, almost a quarter of a million users logged on to label five million colours. Um, so a few more data points there. There's more distinction for some colours among people who identified in the survey as female compared to those who identified as male. A similar focus on the same set of focus colours, though. So, you know, everyone agreed that red was red and that pink was pink in the most, like, brightest shades of those. Um, and everyone agreed that no one can spell fuchsia. So it was a pretty successful study. That's a good thing to be aware of. I can't spell fuchsia. I, I cannot spell fuchsia. So <laughs> I'll, I'll put a link to those notes as well. There's also uh, been some interesting, there's an interesting post by Corey Stamper on her blog. She's an editor at Merriam-Webster talking about the history of defining colour terms in a dictionary. Because especially before we had computers, when you're making a paper dictionary, of course it's going to be printed in black and white, you can't just define a colour the way an interior designer might with like, here's your swatch. You have to give some sort of a description. And for complex colour terms like fuchsia or magenta, you know, sometimes this is easier to do. You can say it's a dark pink or you can say it's a 
it's a pinkish red or something like this. But for simple color terms, you know, how do you define red? That's a more difficult task because you don't have basics there. So she has a, a post about the history of coming up with either very eloquent literary definitions or very technical definitions and some of the difficulties that editors at Merriam-Webster have come up with uh, in terms of defining color terms. There are another group of people who have an effect when it comes to learning language and those people are children. Here's a fun experiment to do if you have a child or if you're near a child is ask them what some colors are because kids are actually quite bad at colors. A lot of them are really terrible at them. So this one paper that I was reading said by two years children can generally learn a highly imageable concrete noun from a single exposure. But they're still making color errors at age six. So colors are not as easy to learn as, you know, this is a dog. Right. So you can show them something that they've never seen before and be like, hey kid, this is a blurg. And they'll learn the word blurg. And then two weeks later you can be like, go get that blurg for me and they'll know exactly what that is. But you can say to a child, what colour is that very purple looking dress over there? And they'll be like, oh, pink. Blue. <laughs> Yeah, and they're aware that color words exist. If you ask them to list how many color words they know, they can list you some that they then can't identify or can't identify correctly. So, and this other thing that the paper showed was that they compared two populations of children. I think it was one English speaking or Western group of kids that got a lot of explicit color instruction with a lot of explicit color terms. And the other one was a group of kids that weren't getting this kind of instruction. I forgot what language they were speaking. And they made the same number of errors at age six. They were still having problems regardless of whether they'd been getting like three years of intensive instruction in colors in preschool or whether they were not really getting any color instruction at all. Right. Okay. So children, bad at colour. Which is weird considering how good children are at a lot of other stuff in language. Yeah. I did not know that. That is a thing I've learned. They're doing complicated verb tenses before they're doing colours. Well, and the other thing is, is even adults will sometimes disagree about colours. If you ever want to have some fun with adults, get an ambiguously coloured scarf or something and ask people whether it's fuchsia or whether it's magenta or whether it's maroon. I'm sure I could have had my friend tearing the class classroom apart with her grey, brown, purple yeah. scarf. Yeah. Or whether something's turquoise or teal or is turquoise, is it more blue or more green? We have this problem in, in my family because I have a dress that used to be my mother's and my mother constantly refers to the red dress. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I both know it as the salmon or the pink dress. Oh. Like it's a very, it's a very rich pink, but it is definitely pink. And it really weirds me out because my mom is an art teacher. Like, I just feel like if someone should be able to know the cutoff between red and really dark pink, and I just wonder, like, are we seeing the world the same way? Like, where does her red stop? I need to get a set of Munsell chips and test my mother. Yeah, you do. I mean, but maybe she has a different cutoff point for, for where the colours are. Like, people disagree about this stuff. And I think that was one of the things that Corey Stamper noted, noted in the dictionary post, is that even when you can pin down a bunch of descriptive terms for colour, some people will disagree about is fuchsia redder than magenta or is magenta redder than fuchsia or something like that. Yeah, or my mum is just wrong <laughs> is the other obvious possibility. I mean, she's your mother, that makes her wrong, right? <laughs> Uh, it's a really nice dress. Thanks for the dress, Mom. But I think, I think these are legitimate areas where people can disagree. One area where you can see that English speakers have changed our conceptions of what we think of as belonging to specific colour boundaries is in what we think of as red. So a lot of people wonder, you know, why do we call people redheads or why do we call hair red when really this is an orange -colored hair? And the thing is, is that there have been English speakers with orange coloured hair, this particular coloured hair, for much longer than English has had a word for orange. Ah, that's why that is. Yeah. So initially, English doesn't have a word for orange. The word for orange gets introduced some in Middle English, but of course, you know, when the first oranges start arriving from warmer climates that are warmer places <laughs> that are not England. <laughs> And up until that point, there hadn't been a word for the colour. And then when the fruit gets introduced, suddenly there's this very salient thing in a colour that is very specific. The Anglo-Saxons had a few words like yellow-red, which was kind of a yellow-red colour. <laughs> 
and saffron, but they most talked about it as red. And the orange is responsible for the introduction of that color, and redhead stuck around as a fossilized term from before we made a distinction between those colors. And so you might wonder, well, why don't we use a different vegetable that is also orange instead of oranges? Surely oranges are kind of kind of far removed from England. But in fact, if you think of other salient orange vegetables, carrots, for example, originally came in a bunch of colors. So you could get carrots in purple, you could get carrots in yellow, you could get carrots in, in orange, and you can still get these at a farmer's market or something, but they're a bit more obscure. So they're not very useful as a reference term for a particular color because how do you know if you're talking about purple or you're talking about orange? And pumpkins are a new world vegetable. They're from the, the Americas. And so they were introduced even later than the orange was. Because orange has really like it's swept Europe. You look at European languages and the word for the color orange is often the same as that fruit. Yeah. And that's because when oranges arrived, people were really like, this is a thing with this colour that we haven't really lexically pinned down in our languages before. Which really, it always does my head in when I hear this, because I just think of orange as such a basic colour. Yeah, it seems really basic to us, but if you think about what kinds of objects they had around them, I mean, you had kind of yellowy browns that you can make easily with plant dyes, and there weren't a lot of very orange objects. So it's just, might as well just kind of lump them in with red. We're not really going to touch on, because, you know, there's so much to talk about with colour as a thing. We're not even kind of touching on the metaphoric extensions that people have for certain colours or the cultural signifiers that certain colours are used as across the world. But one thing I think is fun to talk about is the relationship between colour and other senses. So this crops up in a number of things. One thing I want to talk about is a recent study from De Volk and a bunch of the team at the Meaning Culture and Cognition Lab in Radboud University about the relationship between colour and smells. And in this study they looked at Dutch, Thai and Manic, which is a language spoken by a small hunter-gatherer community in Thailand. So they live in the same kind of similar cultural context to other Thai speakers, but they speak a different language and they live as hunter-gatherers. And the difference in how how these groups describe odors has implications for the colors that they associate okay. with different smells and I, the thing i love about this study is that they to, to distribute the odors they literally just put so they had smells that were very familiar to dutch speakers and smells that were very familiar to people from thailand whether they were thai or manic speakers so they had smells for things like red wine or peanut butter, or they had smells for things like coconut, or smells that were familiar to both groups like banana. And they put these objects, they just literally put like a banana in a spray bottle and then just sprayed, sprayed the smell under people's noses. It was a very lo-fi, but very effective. Like a spray bottle with, with water or just, just with air? Just with air and a banana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is great. And so, like, they repeated the experiment with people twice, and they did things where they asked people to describe the smell and checked with people if they knew what the smell was, like, what the object was that they were smelling. Um, so there were a few things, and what they found was that Dutch speakers usually describe the odour by describing the object. So they would say, you know, if, if we have the banana in the bottle, they'd say oh, it smells like banana. Whereas Thai manic speakers would use words that describe the smell quality. They wouldn't say it smells like a banana, they'd say it smells really sweet. And when people described the odour with an object, so if they said, oh that smells like a banana, when they had to match the colours to the odours, so they, this is the, the final condition was they were asked to match colours to the odours, they found that people who used the word for an object to describe the smell would be more likely to use a colour consistently. So if they smelt peanut butter and said that smells like peanut butter, they would be more likely to pick the colour brown. Whereas if they smelt peanut butter and, and used a term like that smells musty, musty, then they would be less likely to choose a consistent colour. So mustiness doesn't necessarily have a consistent colour association, but like we know what colour peanuts are and they're pretty much always the same colour. Yeah, so their findings suggest that the odour colour associations that people have are most likely formed through language. It's a really neat article and they have a, a great website kind of summarising their findings. We'll put that in the show notes. So one of the things that interests me about colors and words together is that there's a phenomenon called synesthesia where you have these relationships between different senses and one of the most common types of synesthesia is what's called grapheme color synesthesia where you associate certain graphemes, letters and numbers and other types of symbolic shapes with particular colors and I had this kind of synesthesia so it always interests me when you find particular research about this and this is not unfortunately an episode where we're going to talk about all kinds of synesthesia because that would be really cool we should do one of those but one of the things that I find 
is cool is that there's sometimes a connection, like the colors aren't evenly distributed. So my particular set of synesthesia is not, you know, the rainbow is just set down and there's the alphabet sitting along it. I have like more yellow letters than I do purple letters for no particular reason. So every letter of the alphabet has a consistent colour mapping for you. Yeah, and, and all the numbers too. And so a lot of early synesthesia research is just focused on establishing that these are consistent. If you bring synesthetes into the lab and you ask them what colour each letter is, and then a year you bring them back and ask them what colour each letter is, they'll give you the same answer. Whereas for non-synesthetes, they'll be a lot more variable. And this research I find very boring because I already know that my colors are <laughs> consistent and that they're there <laughs> because of course I'm experiencing them, but this is how you do science, I guess. And so later research has been trying to show kind of more complex stuff about it. So this is a, this is a topic I would love to see more people research. <laughs> Okay, we'll do a synesthesia episode at one point. One way you can get kind of color letter effects, even if you're not a synesthete, is you can do what's called a Stroop test. And what this is, is that you take a word like green and you write it in a color ink that does not correspond to the actual word. So you write green with, let's say, red ink. And then you tell people, okay, you need to read the color of the ink, not the word. And people find it really difficult. So you're trying, you're seeing green in letters, but it's in red ink. And so you have to say red. And we'll link to an example of a Stroop test that you can take yourself and see how challenging it is. I am rubbish at them. Yeah, they're really hard because we get so good at words and they They've been used in the psycholinguistics literature for a bunch of different things. You can also fail at a Stroop test and tell us how badly you did um, through the link at the show notes page. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this has been a lot of colour research. There are more cool studies out there. If you have a favourite colour study or colour research or colour etymology, um, do feel free to let us know. Or colour, if you have a favourite colour. Yeah, what's your favourite colour? <laughs> For more Lingthusiasm and links to everything mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. I can be found at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet as Superlinguo, and I blog as Superlinguo as well. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our producer is Claire, and our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. Lingthusiastic.